when the first Confederate ships slipped past the boundaries of the Antares Miasma, they found a galaxy waiting to be explored and settled. But not all stars were open to them. An invisible boundary separated the Confederacy from a region of space that no ship from any nation would ever be permitted to enter. What the Bantherian civilization might once have been has long been debated, for when they were first encountered in 274, they clung to the husks of vast space stations, the glories of their lost empire rotting all around them. On countless such stations, billions of their kind lived in cramped squalor and warred against one another, led by petty tyrants. Despite their apparent barbarism, the Bantherians possessed great hosts of ships, decrepit and ancient, yet showing signs of advanced technology. They were a powerful force, but one focused inward. Their borders were closed, and the Confederacy did its best to not interfere in their affairs. But just over a century after they were first encountered, reports from their frontiers told of an unprecedented mobilization of ships and armies. For their first time in recorded history, gangs and factions who just months earlier had slaughtered one another now moved towards some unknown goal in unison. Confederate reconnaissance satellites and outposts directed every effort towards understanding this mustering, but the wild space of the Banthurians had always beguiled such efforts. In 377, the CAS Dronofeg, the only vessel to ever cross beyond their boundaries, was deployed to investigate, only to be destroyed with all hands, still well outside Banthurian space. Before the Confederacy could issue a protest, the reason for its destruction and the Banthurian's mobilization became clear. His title was beyond translation, a mixture of honorifics and laurels that would have suited an ancient warlord of old Earth. To Antares, he was known simply as the Great Khan. Already wrapped in mystery and legend, his heralds proclaimed that through guile, charisma, military genius, and supernatural power, he had won the devotion and loyalty of the entire Banthurian race. Confederate intelligence struggled to separate the facts of his life from fiction, but one point was undeniable. The Banthurian Carnate was on the move. When the Herald of the Great Khan appeared before the Parliament of Antares, he offered a simple choice, capitulate or be destroyed. Military planners within Antares had long since feared the unification of the Banthurians, and the border was far from undefended. Naval station Koloa was the largest and most formidable of its kind ever built by the Confederacy. It bristled with heavy guns, hangars, and other weapon emplacements, and was itself surrounded by a further network of other, smaller outposts. With the proclamation of the Great Khan, the first and fourth Confederate fleets were sent to assist Koloa, creating the largest concentration of military power in the history of Antares. The first battle of Koloa was a Pyrrhic victory. Both the stations and fleets of the Confederacy had been so ravaged by the Khan's forces that when a second Banthurian armada, equal in size to the first, appeared in the outskirts of the system, there was no choice but to retreat. Naval station Koloa was destroyed, and with it, the road to the heart of Antares lay open. The first world in the path of the Khan was Malacca, pride of the Prithvi star system. It had been discovered in 232, colonized in 291, and had rapidly become the center of the Confederacy's industry and commerce in the region. In orbit was Dar al-Salam, a station the equal of Kaloa in size, but dedicated to commerce and enterprise. In place of gun batteries or military hangars were vast docking spires for trade ships, orbital habitats, and exquisite plazas where species from all across the galaxy brokered deals and traded goods. When the armadas of the Great Khan entered the Prithvi star system, Dar al-Salam and Malacca below fell into panic. An enormous, clumsy evacuation order threw every starport and anchorage into pandemonium as millions attempted to obtain passage beyond the system. 
Looting and chaos erupted across Yost, the only major city on Malacca, while the docking ports of Dar al-Salam were stained with blood as bartering for passage turned violent. It was into these swiftly deteriorating circumstances that General Liliana Reyes began planning the defense of the system. Hastily recalled from Akachi to Koloa, following the proclamation of the Great Khan, by the time she had arrived in the theater, the station had already been destroyed. She was given command of what would become known as the Prithvi Front, and tasked with rallying the survivors of Koloa and reorganizing them and their equipment into a credible defense. Outdated defense plans were modernized and streamlined. When the Banthurian armada that had destroyed Koloa entered Malacca's orbit, the remnants of the 1st and 4th Confederate fleets had long since departed the system. Even without them, however, Dar al-Salam and Malacca had been heavily fortified. The Banthurians had grown so accustomed to fighting each other that the tactics employed by the Confederacy took them by surprise. Largely evacuated, Dar al-Salam was turned into a labyrinth in which comparatively small Confederate units conducted a unique type of asymmetrical warfare. Dozens of independent commands had been hidden and reinforced within the station, from which raids and surgical strikes were conducted against Banthurian forces attempting to use the station for their own logistical needs. Entire sections were detonated by Antares soldiers once their positions were lost taking with them tens of thousands of Banthurians in a last act of defiance. While the battle for Dar al-Salam raged above, fighting erupted on Malacca itself. The majority of this was focused on the capital city of Yost, a prize that the Banthurians were eager to claim for their Khan. Utilizing a vast array of atmospheric transports and orbital drop pods, the equivalent of five Confederate army groups were landed on the outskirts of Yost, surrounding the city and pressing inwards from every side. A sustained orbital bombardment created a firestorm, killing tens of thousands of civilians and turning the city into a vast landscape of rubble and burning ruins. A raid against the Banthurian forces, the Confederate garrison was outnumbered nearly 15 to 1, and before contact was lost with the system, the Antares general staff estimated the city, and then the planet, would fall in no more than two weeks. To negate the advantages of the Banthurian armada in orbit, General Reyes and her subordinate commanders adopted a tactic of keeping their front line's positions as close to the enemy as possible. Reyes herself described this as hugging the Banthurians, and its use slowed their advance by reducing the effectiveness of their supporting fire from both orbit and on the ground. The carnage of the urban fighting on Yost was like nothing else in Confederate history, eclipsing by far even the largest battles against the Anthorians or Beldros. Landmarks that had once been the pride of the city were turned into fortresses. Luban Tower, a multi-kilometer high skyscraper, would become almost legendary in its defiance of the Banthurians, in which a single understrength brigade repelled dozens of attempts to storm the building before it was finally destroyed by an orbital strike. This same story repeated itself dozens if not hundreds of times across the city, as the hordes of the Khan were forced to fight city block by city block, building by building, street by street, and brick by brick. Confederate defenders created a network of tunnels running through ruined buildings and into sewers, Multiple times, Banthurian support elements advanced across what they considered to be dead ground, only for the dead ground to spring back to life and envelop them. Such was the ferocity of her defense, and the disproportionate losses her forces inflicted on the Banthurians, that killing General Reyes became a notable priority for the Khanate. Intercepted transmissions between Banthurian commanders included mention of her as a terrible butcher, and when word of these transmissions circulated across the defenders, the name stuck and provided a welcome boost to morale. General Reyes had hoped to delay the Banthurian conquest of Malacca long enough for a Confederate counterattack, but when multiple Carnate fleets, each equal in size to their armada in orbit, were spotted across the sector front, it was obvious that the fate of their world was sealed. One by one, the fortresses of Yost were stormed or destroyed from orbit. General Reyes herself was killed when fuel silos, 
thought to be empty, were ignited, and burning liquid propellant incinerated her command post. The last major action on Malacca occurred in the center of Yost, around Discovery Plaza. It was led by the 1077th Tank Regiment, together with surviving elements of dozens of other units from the Confederate Army, Confederate Navy, and the Antares Pioneer Corps. Driven by the mistaken belief that General Reyes was still alive and among their number, the Banthurians resisted striking the site from orbit, instead hoping to secure the last defenders. They were killed to a soldier after 30 hours of ferocious resistance, bringing the Battle of Malacca to a close after six months. In the wake of the victory, the Great Khan himself arrived upon Malacca. Together with his highest council, he toured the battlefield of Yost and spoke not only with his own troops, but with Confederate soldiers and citizens that had been captured. The alien, martial culture of the Banthurians demanded that a full account of the battle be made, and the heroics and honors of all involved be properly accounted for. In a strange type of religious ceremony held in the remains of Discovery Plaza, the Khan personally decorated the 99 highest surviving officers among the Confederate defenders. In a speech broadcast to the Confederacy directly, he declared that 248 ships among his vast armadas would be named in honor of the defenders of Malacca. A battleship bearing the name of Liliana Reyes of Antares would be among them. This episode of High Command was based on a battle that occurred during Stellaris Invicta. If you'd like to join the Temple Institute as we guide the Antares Confederacy back to Earth, the next stream will begin on our Twitch channel one hour after this video went live. Additionally, the Fall of Malacca, a new piece of artwork commissioned to commemorate this event, is also available to purchase as a poster over on the Templin Commissary. You'll find the links below.